No Child Left Behind. So this was authorized in 2001 by President George W. Bush. It was a Frankensteining, if you will, of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act from back in the 60s with Johnson's War on Poverty. It held schools accountable for student achievement levels. Accountability came back as the buzzword of the decade. Student achievement levels as broken out by numbers on standardized tests, not performance assessments, not demonstrations of mastery, but standardized assessments. And there were severe penalties for schools that did not make their adequate yearly progress. The numbers on the tests. This is when we started seeing cheating scandals. The next big movement was Common Core. It was an idea that began in 2008. It came from a report from the National Governors Association. This was both business and education driven. Now, clarity. Common Core are standards, not curriculum. This was not very well communicated to the public and part of the reason for the massive backlash. In 2010, Math and English Common Core Standards were released. 42 states and the District of Columbia initially adopted. Now, Texas, Virginia, Alaska, Nebraska never adopted Common Core, and Minnesota only adopted English. Since initial adoption, several states have repealed or replaced. Let me say again, Common Core was shockingly political because it was a joint business and education effort. And the standards were specifically crafted to ensure that the local teachers were designing curriculum, facilitating the learning, getting these students ready in a way to go out into the world and apply the skills that were missing, that the business leaders were saying were missing. Application-oriented, innovative, creative thinking, problem solving, the things the business leaders were crying out for because they weren't finding it in American college graduates, that's what Common Core was built upon. And again, these were goals. They were standards. They were not the curriculum. Common Core standards were only for math and English. In 2013, we had the launching of the Next Gen Science Standards, these have been far less political. In 2015, No Child Left Behind gets replaced with ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. So the goal with ESSA was to get the local schools, the teachers, to take back the responsibility of supporting their individual students, to use the Common Core Standards to design curriculum and facilitate that learning in a way that truly served local populations. You see the quote from the 2015 Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. ESSA led to Race to the Top, a grant program designed to incentivize states to improve education through bold systematic plans that, as President Obama at the time said, would lead to better standards, better teaching, and better schools. 46 states and the District of Columbia submitted applications, and as of 2010, 11 states and the District of Columbia had received awards that went directly to the schools and the teachers for designing and facilitating ranging from 75 million to 700 million to make system-wide coordinated educational improvements for students and teachers in the four core areas. These grants ended in 2015, but there is ongoing information, ongoing research, longitudinal research about how effective these individual grants truly were. Okay, so what does that have to do with curriculum and how does that get us to today? Well, the reality is curriculum is all over the place. There are still places that are using scripted curriculum. There are still places where there are pacing schedules. There are now great leaps and bounds back to the progressive movement, putting the curriculum design back in the hands of teachers. We see the growth of professional learning communities. 
We see social learning theories related to communities of practice coming into the mainstream. Let's note that as of 2015, in the K-12 world of the United States, over 9 million students were engaging in some sort of blended learning program where some of the learning is expected to be happening outside of the classroom via a technologically enhanced experience. And in 2015, over 2 million K-12 students were engaged in some sort of fully online learning program. It doesn't mean they were in fully online schools, but they may have been taking a specific course or two via a fully online program, be that state-sponsored, be that a private academy. Either way, the numbers are growing by leaps and bounds of students involved in blended and fully online learning in the K-12 world. We see huge international conglomerates creating curriculum and materials. Pearson and Scholastic are two of the biggest examples. Project-based learning, there is an immense amount of research about how important this is, particularly for what is considered 21st century curriculum with the four C's of communication, collaboration, creative thinking, and critical thinking. We're also seeing an explosion of teacher-made materials thanks to the web. There are some teachers who are making money selling their curriculum, but in general, what we're seeing are huge online communities of like-minded educators who are sharing what they've been able to create. The communication across the nation for teachers has never been more empowered. And of course, apps, apps, apps. There's an app for everything. And Google Classroom is continuing to make inroads. There are so many positives. Of course, there's always challenges. But what teachers on the ground practitioners are reporting is once they get comfortable with the whole idea of how to allow technology to truly be a tool for education, not the focus of it, but the tool that affords greater education, they're warming up to it more and more every day. Additionally, we have reached a point in society where it's kind of like driver's ed. Would you give someone a horse and a buggy to pass their driver's ed test to learn how to drive a car? With technology being so integrated into almost every aspect of our everyday lives, to not meaningfully, professionally integrate the use of technology into the learning process does students a great disservice because it doesn't prepare them for going out and applying those four C's of critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity in real world contexts. So where does this leave us as we look toward tomorrow? Well, regarding curriculum, there's more opportunities to access it. Education will continue to be more available wherever, whenever, and whatever, thanks to technology. And again, I am specifically talking about the K-12 world. Oftentimes when we talk about technology affording this kind of learning, people think that means college and adults, but it does truly relate to the K-12 world. There are more issues of equity on the table, but they're not the same ones we had in the 90s. In the 90s, it was, can you get computers in the schools for everybody? Now it's how is the technology being used? Are the students being taught to master the technology so that they are empowered to truly engage in the four C's of learning? Or are the students being taught to sit back and be passive receptacles and let the computer master them. Big, big issue of equity there. There will continue to be more online academies growing. There will continue to be more integrated subjects. We will see more political battles related to K-12 education across state and federal lines. With more technology, we will see more teacher organizations such as ISTE, such as INACOL, trying to gather political power to serve their base. One thing we definitely know is we absolutely positively will continue to need more teachers 
who know how to design and facilitate 21st century curriculum where the student is not passive, where the student is an engaged part of the learning process. Yes, I'm going back to Dewey. And yes, I'm bringing in all kinds of social learning theories. That's for another video. Where does this leave us today? Right here, right now. What's the big takeaway? Well, the big takeaway should be that education in the United States will never be an easy, simple, single subject to discuss, debate, lead, practice. Because we are a nation of individuals trying to serve individuals. We do not have one single image that we are working to replicate. From across time and space, we see that our educational models and the curriculum has modified, has grown, has evolved, sometimes devolved, to meet the needs of the society of the time. Yet, when push comes to shove, because education is a right of the states, it's always going to be a challenge to try and bring the entire system under one singular umbrella. Now, whether that's right or wrong, it's a good goal, that is not what I'm trying to discuss here. What I want you to understand from going through all of this information is that curriculum is powerful and it is nuanced and it's not simply a matter of picking the right book to share with the kids at the right time. That curriculum is rich and messy and relevant in ways beyond the classroom and that truly is our right to think about and our responsibility to design and facilitate meaningfully as 21st century American educational professionals. Thank you for your time and attention.